Well, good morning and welcome to our Tuesday morning service. It's so great to be able to meet together. And in a moment, we're going to have some worship and Mark will open the word up to us. But before that, we have a special birthday today. It's Ben's 30th birthday. So happy birthday, Ben, from the whole church. And we pray you'll have a blessed day. Might not have been the day you planned, but we pray that God will bless you in it. So let's pray as we come to worship. So Father God, we thank you for Ben and we pray your blessings on him this day and throughout the year. And Lord, as the team leaders in worship, we pray you'll open our hearts to worship you. We pray you'll bless Mark as he opens your word to us. And that you would speak afresh to us this morning. So we say, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Come set your rule and reign In our hearts again Increase in us, we pray Unveil why we're made Come set our hearts ablaze with hope Like wildfire in our very souls Holy Spirit, come invade us now Cause we are your church And we need your power in us We seek your kingdom first We hunger and we first Refuse to waste our lives For your our joy and prize To see the captive heart release The hurt, the sick, the poor at peace We lay down our lives for heaven Cause we are your church and we pray revive this earth. Welcome to day two of Praying the Jesus Way, a daily study uh, based on the Lord's Prayer. 
Each day, as I said, we're going to start by reading the words of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 9 to 13. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Today we're going to be looking at that phrase, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we read the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, we see the picture of God's creation under his rule and authority. And we see Adam and Eve living in a perfect relationship with God in a place called Eden. But with one test of their loyalty always there, the question is, will they obey God and God's rule or will they eat of the forbidden fruit? Well, we don't have to wait long to find out that they fail the test. And the rest of the scriptures are really the story of our rebelling against God and God's unending mercy towards us. So when we pray your kingdom come, we're praying in reality for a restoration of God's rule and authority over each one of us and over our world. But what is God's kingdom? And what does it mean to pray for God's kingdom to come? Well, God's kingdom is a huge subject and we won't be able to cover all of it in a few minutes. But in some ways, it's easier to talk about what God's kingdom is not. It is not war or famine or unforgiveness or selfishness or racism or nationalism or sin of any kind. But God's kingdom is wherever God rules. And it's to be found wherever a person or people submit to God's leading. As Jesus said in Matthew 6, we must seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to us. When we pray, your kingdom come. We pray that God's reign will begin with me, with us, in our hearts, be at the centre of who we are. That our lives will be submitted and submissive to the will and word and reign of God. As it says in Galatians 2.20, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Your kingdom come then is a prayer that our lives and our allegiance will be given over to God's law, given over to God's rule, God's purpose for all creation. So why does Jesus teach us to pray for God's kingdom to come? Well, we must remember that when we pray for God's kingdom to come, we're not thinking of some mystic future event, not some version of pie in the sky when we die. Prayer for the kingdom to come is a prayer for justice to be done and to be done now. When we pray your kingdom come, we're asking God to bring his justice and peace into our historical situation, into our reality, into our lives. So when Jesus cured the sick in the New Testament, as he did in Luke 10 verse 9, he would often use words similar to the words he used there. The kingdom of God has come near to you. God has broken into your world. We can therefore experience me of God's kingdom now, God breaking into our world, into our lives, bringing transformation. Really, this is the heart of the gospel message that we preach. The Lord's Prayer is also a prayer for us to yield to God's will. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The whole of Jesus' life was lived under the control and will of God. Everything he did from being born to his death and resurrection was a fulfilment of God's will for his life. Jesus submitted to the authority of God and he taught us in the Lord's Prayer to pray, your will be done. And Jesus in this models for us the essence of both the Christian life and the life of prayer, yielding ourselves to God's purposes. So when we pray, your will be done, it's a confirmation of our willingness to go his way, to do his bidding, to submit our will to his. But we all know that wanting to do God's will is far, easy, far easier to say than to actually do. It's hard 
because it involves the breaking down, the laying down of our own will, our willfulness. In Matthew 26, we read that very moving story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night before he died. And we see that being willing to do the will of God is not always an easy thing. Here we see Jesus in the garden pleading with Jesus that there might be some other way to deliver our salvation. He cries out three times to God, but each time he yields his will to God, finally saying, not my will, but your will be done. Do you notice the echo of the words of the Lord's Prayer here? It's surely no coincidence that the same words taught to us by Jesus in the Lord's Prayer are the words that he uses at the moment of one of his greatest trials. And the willingness of Jesus to yield his will to God's will ultimately led him to the cross. Your will be done is a prayer that God will direct us wherever that may lead and that may not always lead to pleasant places. When we finish praying your will be done, Jesus adds the words on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it, as it is in heaven is a turning point in the prayer. At this point we're about halfway through. And the emphasis shifts the focus of the prayer from heaven to the needs and struggles that we face on earth. If you notice the first three petitions of the prayer are about God's name, God's kingdom, God's will. But the last three are about our sustenance, our forgiveness and our deliverance. But throughout we're praying that our present experience might come to reflect God's heavenly reality. As a pause for thought today, I want to share with you a prayer written by John Wesley in the 1750s. This covenant prayer is used by most Methodists on the first service of the year, every year. It's a prayer of yielding and an expanded version of your will be done, if you like. And I would encourage you maybe to learn this prayer for yourself. This is what Wesley wrote. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant now made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. What a great prayer. Friends, in these times of great uncertainty and anxiety that we're going through as individuals, as a nation, as a world, what better hope and security do we have than to place our lives into God's hands and to say, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I hope to see you again tomorrow when we'll continue to look at this prayer and what it means to ask God to give us our daily bread. Amen.
So thank you, Mark, for bringing God's word to us today. So let's just pray. So Lord, we bring before you the world. And we pray for all those who are suffering with this virus, those who've lost loved ones, who are mourning. Also those who are living in war-torn countries, those who are fighting hunger and poverty and disease. Lord, we pray in the life of our world, your kingdom come, your will be done. We pray for our own country, Lord, for all those in leadership roles, that you would guide them. We pray for those who serve in the National Health Service. We pray for those teachers who are looking after key workers' children, and for all those who serve in communities up and down this land. Lord, in the life of our land, we pray your kingdom come, your will be done. We pray for people in need, especially at this time, those who are suffering and struggling to get better from this virus. We pray for those who've lost loved ones, that you would comfort them. But we pray for others who have illnesses and disabilities, those who suffer abuse at this time, and Lord, for those who have mental health issues. 
in the lives of those in need, we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. And we pray for those in our own community. Pray for our families and our friends and those we love. Lord, especially today, we pray for children and parents, sisters and brothers, friends and neighbours. And in the lives of those we love, we pray, your kingdom come, O Lord, your will be done. And we pray for ourselves as church at this time, Lord, that we would keep our eyes fixed on you, that we would... Uh, serve this community in love, that we would continue to proclaim the gospel. So in the life of our church, Lord, we pray your kingdom come, your will be done. Pray that you'll accept these prayers today in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. So that's our service for today and we'll be back tomorrow at 10 o'clock. So I hope to see you then. Bye.